welcome to the final class. Today we're going to be finishing off our discussion about content providers, focusing primarily on content providers that allow you to have asynchronous access to the contents. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to talk a little bit about why you might want to be able to access things asynchronously. Basically being able to kind of disconnect the sending of something from its ultimate reception and processing. So if you take a look at all the content providers that we've done so far, you've noticed that they've all done synchronous two-way communication, which is a the pro of doing this is it's very intuitive. It follows the conventional request rec response method interaction patterns that we're also familiar with. You make a method call, you block till the call is done, you get the result back, you keep going. The downsides are, number one, it doesn't really leverage the parallelism that's inherent on the platform. So while you're blocked waiting for the call to finish, you can't be doing anything else unless you have another thread, of course. Uh, but that thread is blocked. And secondly, it can be a problem when you start doing long operations, especially long queries, in an environment where you're trying to invoke things in the main thread of control. So we've talked about this a gazillion times. Should be no big, big surprise here. The main issue, of course, is when you do loading and queries, that is potentially a fairly I.O. intensive operation. If, if it's a large query that takes a while to resolve, or if you have to go across a slow network, you probably don't want to be blocking for that duration of that call. So an alternative set of approaches that are available on Android involve the use of two-way asynchronous operations. And in some ways, these are like the asynchronous AIDL calls we talked about, where you decouple in time and space the invocation of a method from the processing of the result that comes back when the method is done. The benefit here, of course, is it can leverage parallelism more effectively. You can have uh, multiple things going on. You can be processing things in the background. You can be responding to user interaction requests from the GUI and so on. And of course, it also doesn't block the main thread of control. The downsides are that it's somewhat more complicated to program because you have to understand some additional patterns, things like the pro-actor pattern and the asynchronous completion pattern. We probably won't have time in this class today to talk about those patterns in much detail. Uh, when I do the, the MOOC that's going to be taking place in uh, a couple months, we'll go in that in much more detail. So if you come back then, you can learn more about this stuff because I'll have more time to record it all. There's a couple of different asynchronous content provider access models in Android. One model uses something called cursor loaders and the loader manager framework in order to be able to essentially initiate load operations and then have them run in the background and then when they're done you get callbacks through a framework method which can then be used to go ahead and display the results wherever you feel like displaying them. There's something called the loader protocol and there's basically a framework in Android for doing loaders for all kinds of things. Uh, cursor loaders being the, one of the main things you're most likely to run across unless you write your own custom loaders. And there are various tutorials online you might take a look at for how to write custom loaders. Another approach for doing asynchrony is something called asynchronous complete, um, completion, or sorry, asynchronous query handlers. And asynchronous query handlers implement a couple of different patterns, no, most notably the proactor pattern and the asynchronous uh, completion token pattern. And it's used to be able to allow many operations to run uh, asynchronously on content providers, not just queries. So there's a couple of different approaches. So in a nutshell, asynchrony is a very powerful technique, takes better advantage of the underlying hardware often. Uh, if you understand the patterns, it can be a very powerful thing to program. And it, it's not that hard to program once you understand the patterns. It's also very, very widely used within Android itself. If you look in packages apps, you will see uh, about half dozen apps in there like the browser, calendar, contacts, MMS, SMS, email, and so on all of which use this loader manager uh, approach. We'll also see how some, some of the MMS, SMS app functionality uses the async query handler approach as well. So if you want to learn more about how this stuff works, you can go and take a look at the actual implementation. We're going to strip it down a little bit in the next discussion so you don't get lost in all the details, but it's uh, something you can learn more about as you see fit. OK, so the first thing we're going to talk about here is how to program with the loader manager and the loader manager framework. So it's essentially a, a way of accessing content providers asynchronously, and it gives you a framework. And we'll see what does it mean to be a framework. Does anybody remember what one of the key characteristics of a framework is from way back in the day? 
control. Inversion of control. So you don't call all the operations. You don't manage all the steps. You don't e manage every step in the control flow. You initiate something, and then the framework does all the stuff for you on your behalf, and then it calls you back at certain crucial points in time, like when you need to initiate uh, a query, when you need to go ahead and get the results of a query. It has callbacks back to your application code. Uh, can anybody think of another example of a framework in Android that also did this sort of thing in the background with threads to run concurrently? What was the other example of a framework that we looked at in great detail having to do with uh, concurrency? Async task, right? So the async task framework is another framework that basically you kind of set the wheels in motion, you provide a bunch of hooks, and then it calls you back when interesting things happen. Um, and it's kind of interesting to compare and contrast the use of async task for what we're looking at here versus the use of uh, the loader manager. In fact, your current programming assignment is doing exactly that, right? One of, one of the versions you're doing is having an async task that goes ahead and runs in the do in background method a two-way synchronous communication to be able to query the content provider. And then you're also doing a variety of different other approaches using loader managers, cursor loaders, and async query handlers. So just different ways of doing stuff. So to understand the loader manager, you first have to understand a little bit about loaders themselves. So a loader is an abstract class which is very common in frameworks, by the way, because it's going to give you some of the functionality and leave a variety of different hooks for you to fill in. And basically what a loader does is it ensures that all the cursor operations are done in the background. And therefore, you don't have to worry about blocking the user interface thread. Um, the other thing that loaders will do is while they're running, they can be used to monitor the source of the data. And they can check to see whether anything changes. And if something changes, then they'll automatically call hooks to ensure that you're notified. This goes back to the conversation we were having right before class about not having to call the notify change method because this is being done for you now as part of the underlying loader manager framework. So a loader manager is basically an interface and some additional uh, mechanisms that are basically used to manage one or more loaders that are associated with a loader manager. So it's kind of a coordinator or an orchestrator for loaders. So it's basically to be in charge of doing things like starting, stopping, restarting, retaining, destroying, and so on and so forth, the loaders that it is going to control. When you have a loader manager uh, controlling a loader, some things become easier because it handles them for you behind the scenes. For example, things having to do with restarts that occur when reconfigurations change. Rather than you having to make sure to restart these queries yourself and do the requerying operations, the loader manager will do that stuff on your behalf. So it means your programming becomes much simpler, even though someone might change the phone from landscape to portrait mode, and so on and so forth. The most common form of loader manager, or a very common form of loader manager, is to combine it with something called a cursor loader. And a cursor loader is basically an extension of the, thanks, basically an extension of the async task loader, which as the name implies is something that runs in the background. And it basically runs asynchronous queries in the background on behalf of uh, a, an activity or fragment that called it. And it communicates with the underlying content provider in this async-like way with a separate thread. And when it's all done, it goes ahead and dispatches callbacks that end up allowing the user to take the results of the query. The, the point was that the uh, cursor loaders are used to do the work in the background. Uh, it works with loader managers to do the work in the background in order to make sure that you can get the results done asynchronously and return back to whatever context it is that called these. And again, they don't end up blocking the UI. Um, so one of the things you typically can do, you can, you can do these in a couple of different ways. One thing you can do is you can create a cursor loader. And when you create the cursor loader, you can go ahead and give it all the various parameters you want in the call to the constructor of the cursor loader. So here's an example where we have a method called make cursor loader. It's a factory method. And as you can see, it goes ahead and it creates a new cursor loader. And uh, it passes in a context in your URI and a bunch of other null fields that we don't care about for other, other parameters to it, like the selection and the selection args and so on. Um, and that's one way to do it. Or you can also go ahead and create a cursor loader with just a context. And you can populate the various fields you care about one at a time by invoking 
helper methods like the uh, set URI field and so on. Basically, it's the same difference. Uh, in practice, you're probably well advised to hide this kind of detail behind a factory method anyway, like we're doing here, so that the bulk of your code is isolated and shielded from these kinds of lower level decisions. So here's how you use cursor loader. And once we go over these slides, it should be pretty straightforward to be able to understand how to do the, the next uh, the current programming assignment. So what you need to do is you need to typically inherit your activity from loader uh, manager loader callbacks. And you can parameterize this with the kind of thing you want it to work on. In this case, it's cursors, but you could make your own thing and, and plug in a different kind of class. So as you can see here, we're going to go ahead and make a subclass. Or we're going to subclass from loader callbacks, or implement loader callbacks, which is an interface. And then we end up with an activity that has certain hook methods defined as part of its core methods it exposes. Uh, one of those methods is the onCreateLoader method. And this, of course, is going to get called when you first start up. And it's going to be used to tell the uh, underlying loader manager framework which cursor loader to work with. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and say make cursor loader. And we're going to pass in the context as well as the URL or URI that we want to be able to, to work on in this particular case. And it goes off and you know goes ahead and starts that. And it runs it in the background thread. Then at some point, henceforth, when the load has completed, when the, the call to query is done, then the onload finished callback takes place. And as you can see, what it does here is it goes ahead and it calls, um, it passes in a cursor, and then we would go ahead and load the image from a cursor. So that's the code you actually have to write. So I didn't put it all there, but you can get the idea of what goes on. Um, and it can basically call, the loader manager can call back to this method the on load finished method multiple times as the underlying content is updated. So that's, again, why you don't have to actually make those calls explicitly in your content provider, because it's being done for you on, on your behalf by the under loader, underlying loader manager framework. And then there's also another method called on loader reset, which can be used to um, make the data unavailable at, at certain points when that's important. So the real key methods in this case, though, are on create loader and on load finished. Those are the two ones that are the kind of the workhorses for what you're doing. As you can see, there it's a framework. They get invoked. And notice how they get invoked in the main thread of control, in the UI thread. But the stuff that's taking place behind the scenes is all going on in a background thread. So that's why I said it before. It's, it's a little bit like the async task framework in some ways. So let's take a look now and see how we might actually program this particular um, mechanism. So we're going to implement the uh, same example we had done before, a very simple interface that adds records and removes records and so on. And we're going to do them now, instead of doing it synchronously in the main thread of control, instead what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do them asynchronously using the loader manager and the cursor loader. So it's going to look pretty much like uh, same behavior, but it'll be done in a different way. So here's what we start out with. We create ourselves a, an activity called contact provider activity async, because it's an async activity. And as you can see, it goes ahead and implements the loader manager loader callbacks method, or class. And then we define a few things we're going to need in order to be able to make the framework work together. Keep in mind that you can actually have multiple loaders going on simultaneously. A loader manager can manage multiple loaders. So you have to give each of the loaders that it's managing a unique loader ID. So we call one loader ID, give it a 0. We could give it whatever value we want, as long as it's unique. We then go ahead and define an instance of something called loader manager loader callbacks cursor m callbacks. And that's going to be used to actually keep track of who to call back on when we're done. As you'll see later in a slide or two, we're going to actually initialize and assign this thing to this because we are a loader callbacks object. And that way, our methods will get dispatched, our methods being methods like um, on create loader and on load finished and so on and so forth. And then finally, we go ahead and make a, a simple cursor adapter, which is going to be used in a kind of clever and um, a bit subtle and, and not necessarily intuitive way uh, how we're going to get the results of the loader to display in our list uh, activity that we want to have later. You can see that we're also a list activity. So we want to be able to have a way to have a list view of the results that we have when all is said and done. And to do that, we're going to use our, our simple cursor adapter. And it's, it's kind of a little bit too clever for its own good, but you'll see in a second how it works. 
Now, if you were to look at the full-blown implementation of all this stuff, you'd see that a big chunk of the beginning part of this onCreate method is identical to what we had in the previous code. You're inserting various records, you're deleting records, you're updating records, and so on. And when it's all said and done, you now get to a point when you want to go ahead and display these things. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and create our data columns and our view IDs, just like we've done before. And then we go ahead and make a new simple cursor adapter. And if you were to go back and look at the original code, you'd see it's very similar with one important distinction. And that is that rather than passing in a cursor that we got back from calling query synchronously on the content resolver, on the content provider, through the content resolver, instead we pass in a null. And what null is going to do is it's a signal or it's an indication to the underlying system that this particular simple cursor adapter is going to be used with a loader manager. So don't expect to take it and try to display it right now. Wait a little bit further, and then when the actual data shows up, go ahead and use, use it then to display what we want to have. Any, any questions about that? So the key thing is it's, it's initially null, and that's the subtle part. It's, again, it's very clever, but it's not very uh, intuitive unless you know the trick. There's still a few more steps we need to, to uh, carry out in order to make all this stuff work. We go ahead and make this, we set the list adapter to the M adapter, M adapter being this thing that points to the cursor, simple cursor loader, or simple cursor adapter. We then go ahead and make the M callbacks, loader callbacks object be initialized to this, to ourselves, so that that way it'll dispatch back to our methods. If you don't want to do that, of course, you could make your own uh, instance of loader callbacks that was separate and, and then make an instance of that. Dif different ways of looking at how to do this. It gives you a flexibility in making a decision about how to align things and, and associate them. And then the final thing we do is we go ahead and start up the framework. So just like with async task, you call execute, and that sets the wheels in motion. So too with loader manager, you say init loader, and you pass in the loader ID, which if you recall is just zero in this case, a null, and then you pass in m callbacks. And uh, you can go ahead and take a look at this URL for more information about the init loader method that's defined on loader manager. But what that's basically going to do is, is set the wheels in motion at this point. And uh, the first thing it's going to do is the framework will turn around and call back on the onCreateLoader hook method. And that hook method, as you can see here, is going to go ahead and, and uh, essentially do, get yourself a new cursor loader. So this is not actually going to do the load. It's just going to get yourself a cursor loader. And that, of course, will then get passed to a thread that's running in the background through the async task loader portion of this framework. And that will go ahead and run and do the work. And then the result will come out shortly. When the result is, fa oh, and by the way, um, keep in mind that, that all of this stuff, uh, you know, when this call takes place, when the init loader call takes place, that call just returns. And so your onCreate method returns. And now your activity is ready to handle other kinds of events. You can handle other user interface, interface events. For example, someone could cancel all this stuff if they chose to. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, and it makes your interface interactions a lot more smooth and less jerky and so on. When the, the query is finally processed and the results are complete, there's a call by the framework to on load finished. And as you can see here, it passes back the loader that it was doing the work on the behalf of, as well as the cursor that now has the necessary data that, that you have come to expect it to have, except that was received in the background as, as an asynchronous operation. So what we do now is we go ahead and we do a switch statement to figure out which loader this is from. In our particular case, we only had one loader. But keep in mind, the loader manager can manage multiple loaders. So in this case, we go ahead and say, if it's the loader ID loader, kind of a boring name, uh, that means that the async load is complete and the data is available in our simple cursor adapter. And so what we then do is we go ahead and we swap the original cursor in the cursor adapter, which if you recall was null. And now we replace it with the cursor that's been returned back from the loader manager loader framework, the cursor loader part. And that swaps it. And at that point, we actually have a non-null uh, cursor. And so we'll go ahead and have that information displayed on the, the screen. So pretty cool, right? It, you give, when you give it a null originally, it 
realizes, aha, I don't have what I need to do to get my work done. And when it's done, it can then turn around and, and uh, replace it just doing a swap, and away you go. Any questions about that? Kind of cool. So to summarize this particular discussion, the Loader Manager framework helps applications manage these long-running operations, usually queries in this case, uh, in conjunction with activities and fragments and the life cycle that they have to deal with. So it helps make things more responsive. And uh, by far the most common use of Loader Manager is with cursor loaders, although if you're really inspired, you can go ahead and, and add some additional machinery and make your own custom loaders for other kinds of things that you might want to load. Okay, any questions or comments about loader managers and cursor loaders? So that should give you a help for your assignment. Yeah? For this homework, I've been doing this loader managers anonymous inner class. Uh -huh. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the final topic today, and then we'll do the quiz, uh, really deals with another variant of asynchrony, which is kind of cool. Um, so we're going to talk now about how to do asynchronous access to content providers using async query handlers, which are a different mechanism, um, arguably more flexible perhaps, although also a bit more complicated in some ways as well. Loader managers are really kind of optimized for loading, um, for doing queries out of the box, loader managers and cursor loaders. But uh, all the other operations like insert, delete, update, and so on, those things would still be done synchronously. So if you don't want to have that limitation, then you want to use the async query handler class and the various patterns necessary to use it. And it will give you a way to do a lot more operations to run in an asynchronous manner. For example, you can start a delete operation that will do the deletions asynchronously. You can start an insert operation to do inserts asynchronously. You can start queries to do queries asynchronously. You can start an update operation to do update operations asynchronously, right? So basically all the operations, all the key operations you can do on content providers are handled for you automatically with the, with the async query handler framework and mechanisms. You can also go ahead if you want to and you can cancel operations uh, via the cancel operation method, which can be used to cancel stuff if you decide you don't want to actually let them continue to run. Obviously, cancel operations is a little tricky because you're not quite sure what state things are in. Um, but as long as it hasn't you know, finished and uh, we're already giving you the results back, it'll go ahead and cancel it. Now, here's where things get interesting. So initiating operations asynchronously is, is part of the, the battle. But getting the results back and doing something with them is the other half. And that's, again, where things get pretty cool. So there's also a set of hook methods that are defined as part of async query handler that you have to fill in to handle the completion of all these operations that have been invoked asynchronously. For example, there's an on delete complete operation. And that's what gets called back with the results of doing the asynchronous delete operation when you do start delete. And there are equivalent ones for insert, query, and update as well. So basically what you're doing is you're invoking the operations asynchronously and then there are callback hooks that get that you have to go ahead and define yourself as the user to handle all the completion of these various operations. Now it turns out that that's actually a pair of patterns that are used here which we'll talk about in a second. One of which is called the proactor pattern and the other which is called the asynchronous completion token pattern. And in the example we're about to look at you'll see how both patterns get used. So what we're going to do here is show how to implement the same content provider abstraction, just like we did before, except now we're going to use the uh, async query handler as opposed to using the loader manager or the async task or something. So uh, as you can see here, we have ourselves a content provider activity async, just like we did before. It extends list activity. However, in this particular case, it doesn't have to do anything else. It doesn't have to go ahead and, and inherit from uh, uh, loader callbacks or anything like that. We then go ahead and make our simple cursor adapter, just like we had done before. No, no real complications there. Where things get more interesting now is the next class, which is a class I, I created. I made it an abstract class because it's not entirely finished. You have to fill in some of the blanks. And this thing is called a completion handler. And as you can see, it inherits from async 
query handler. And what it's going to do is it's going to actually implement a pair of patterns. It's going to implement the command pattern and the asynchronous completion token pattern. And the whole underlying framework implements the proactor pattern. We'll talk more about that in a second. The main thing that completion handler does, above and beyond what async query handler does, is it defines an execute method, which is basically what you would get with the uh, command pattern. So the command pattern or command processor pattern defines an execute method, which is going to be used to run the command. <clears throat> the actual thing that should be called is run next command, and you'll see how that's going to work in a second. So let's take a look at the way we might use this particular little framework in order to do completely asynchronous operations for everything. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the insert query handler, which is a completion handler. Right? If you take a look here, you can see that insert query handler extends completion handler. And it contains two data members, one of which is called next command, and the other is called m value. So insert query handler's constructor stashes away the value and the next command. And you'll see what next command is used for shortly. It's, it's used in a ridiculously clever way uh, that's kind of fun. Here is the execute method. This is the method that's going to be used to actually run this particular operation. And you can see what it does is it goes ahead and it creates a new content values object, sticks the value into it under the, under the key data. So the data will be the value. The data will point to the value. And then we invoke an asynchronous insert operation on the content URI, so it's indicating which thing we want to do this on, and we pass in the next command. Now, the next command thing is the part that's a little bit mysterious. This is what's called the asynchronous completion token. It's also referred to as a cookie. And basically what happens is that this cookie is stored by the underlying async completion handler framework, and it's not observed or modified or accessed in any way, shape, or form. It's just held. And when the call is finished, in other words, when we're done doing the, the insert operation with those values, the on insert complete method gets called back. And as you can see, one of the methods, which is the cookie, if you look at the interface, is the next command to run. So what we do in this case is we turn around and we take the result that comes back and we downcast it to be a completion handler, and we say, next command, execute yourself. So what's going to happen here is whenever you invoke an operation, you're not only going to tell it what to do, you're also going to give it the next thing you want it to do. And so these things are going to be chained together. And so what happens there, just to reiterate, this asynchronous completion token, this next command, is passed through the async completion handler framework. And when it comes back to you when you're done, you use it to invoke the next thing in the sequence. And when you see the final stream of consciousness command chain that is used to run this code, you'll see how it all works. It's, it's really, really cool. So the completion hook method is used to kick off the next command. Yes, sir? Why isn't the object or like the completion handler parameterized so that you don't have to pass it? Like, that oh, you mean make it like a, um, make it like a parameterized type? Right. Well, the reason for that is that um, <laughs> this thing is trying to treat this in as generic a way as possible. <clears throat> now, having said so, so the underlying framework just works on objects, right? That's the that's the most generic thing you can have in Java. Um, but you raise a good point. I could have used, I could have implemented this as a. Uh, I could have implemented my little framework. I could have implemented completion handler as a template class, where I would parameterize it with. You know, I, I could have insert query handler be parameterized, and then I could not avoid having to do the downcast. So that would be another way to do it. Keep, keep in mind, though, well, I, take, I take that back. Um, I, I, that would just avoid a few extra things. It could make it more generic. This, this on insert complete hook method is still going to give it back to you as an object. So you're going to have to downcast that some way or another. The reason for doing that is that they just wanted to make it as generic as possible. Okay. Here is delete update query handler. You'll see how that gets used. It's, it kind of does double duty. It both deletes and updates stuff. So its constructor goes ahead and takes the item that it wants to delete and the item it wants to update, and it gives it the value it wants to update it to. 
And then when it's executed, it goes ahead and makes a new update query handler, which is going to be the asynchronous completion token. So the next thing will be an update, and it passes in the various parameters. And then it goes ahead and it ex uh, adds a, a suffix onto the original URI to indicate what element to delete. So you can indicate which particular element you want to have deleted. So in our case, we're going to delete different elements, like we'll replace item 1 with a different value or something like that. And then when we're done, once again, uh, on delete complete, when called, we'll have been given the magic cookie next command to run, which was passed in up here. So it'll go ahead and, and start the next thing off. Here's the update query handler. So as you can see, in this particular case, it stores a bunch of things. It goes ahead and invokes the asynchronous update operation. And this update operation will basically go ahead and do the updates. And then it'll go ahead and kick off the next thing when it completes. There's a, there's a consistency with all the behaviors here. And here's the query query handler. This is the guy that actually does uh, the query. And you can see its purpose in life is essentially to get things displayed when we're all done. So its execute method goes ahead and starts an asynchronous query against this particular content URI. And then when that query, which was run asynchronously, completes, it goes ahead and takes the results and makes a cursor, a simple cursor adapter, and then makes that be the list adapter. So now it's going to go ahead and display that. So that's a little bit like what the loader manager is doing when the onload finished method gets called back. You're kind of doing that tweaking, and, and then things can get, be displayed at that point. Uh, this is just a little bit more, a little bit less um, implicit than the loader manager stuff. So here finally is the program that does everything. It's kind of cool. It looks a little bit like a Lisp program because it's very nested. So what we're doing here basically is we're inserting value 1, 2, and 3 into the content provider. And then we delete item 1 and change the value of item 2 to value to item 4. So that, that's what we're doing. That's, that's what that stream of operations is doing. So essentially what it's happening is we're creating a, a bunch of query, uh, various kinds of query handlers, inserts and deletes and so on. And um, uh, they're just basically being passed in here and grouped together in a very clever way where the second parameter to all these things is the asynchronous completion token that's needed to do the next command. So this is basically saying insert value 1 and make its next command insert value 2. And that guy's next command inserts value 3. And that guy's next command does the delete update query. And so on and so forth. So it's basically just a way to nest it all together. And then when we're all done, we say execute. And they all run the commands. And the whole thing is driven by asynchronous callbacks. So async query handler is basically a helper class and, and really more of a, a framework, if you will, because you have to subclass and fill in hook methods and so on, that makes it easier to do asynchronous operations on content providers, a broad range of asynchronous operations. Insert, a query, delete, update, and so on and so forth. This particular abstraction, as cool and powerful as it is, is actually not very widely used in Android. There's only a handful of places where it's used. One of them is in the, uh, it's used extensively throughout the MMS and SMS application. Uh, for example, when you go ahead and do a query to, to look up things, to search for things, like you want to search for a pattern in your, your SMS and, and MMS logs, uh, it goes ahead and does an asynchronous query with the particular search sequence you're looking for. And when that query is finished, it goes ahead and sees what came back, and then it displays that in a, a view. So you can go ahead and see what the search query returned. There are not many other places where this is used in Android except for MMS, SMS. But it's used there extensively for a bunch of different kinds of things. Now, the last couple things I want to point out, and, and again, we really won't have time to talk about this in, in great detail today. But essentially, um, the async query handler framework implements a couple of really cool patterns, one of which is called the proactor pattern and the other which is called the async completion token pattern. The proactor pattern is essentially a pattern that's used to invoke operations asynchronously along with 
information about how to complete them. And when the operations are finished, they end up being dispatched by completion handlers. So this, this actually maps perfectly onto what the async query handler is doing. So the op async operations here are things like start insert, start delete, start query, and so on. And you give them the information that we were looking at before. Um, and one of the things that you pass in is the, the asynchronous completion token, which we'll look at in a second. When those operations are finished, they know how to dispatch the completion event handlers, the, the completion handlers that are defined on the subclass for async query handler that you had to fill in. So that's kind of how the proactor pattern works. So basically, if you take a look at this example, you start running the event loop. Um, a request comes in like start, you know, start or, or start query, start delete, start insert, and so on. And that goes ahead and kicks off the asynchronous call. The control returns to the caller. Stuff happens in the background. When the results are done, they're dispatched by invoking a callback method on a completion handler object of some kind. And that's called the proactor pattern. Uh, there are other examples of proactor that appear in various frameworks. Um, there's stuff that you can find, for example, in uh, Python that implements this. C++ has very powerful support for this. Java has some support for proactor. It's a very common way of handling asynchronous operation processing within a framework. One of the pieces that you use typically in a proactor to make it easier to provide processing hints or processing results when operations complete, or to be able to efficiently demultiplex the processing when completion events occur, to, to get them to be handled properly by the, the, uh, the completion handler, is to use something called an asynchronous completion token. And again, this is basically a kind of a little magic cookie that's passed in when you invoke the asynchronous operation. And it travels throughout the framework, never touched by the framework. And when, it, you're, when the operations are done running asynchronously, the call comes back, and it gives you back the object you passed in. <clears throat> in the example I showed you here, we use that in order to be able to get the, the next command to run automatically. You don't have to do that. You could have made that null and programmed it some other way. It's just a real clever way of being able to get the results back to do the next operation in the asynchronous processing chain. One of the really cool things about these patterns is it allows us to write very efficient code that only has one or a very limited number of threads of control. And the typical pattern that you do is you have a main thread of control that kicks off operations and then returns to either wait for the results of the completion of those asynchronous operations or to do something else on behalf of users or other sources of input. And all the actual processing runs in the background, either asynchronously or in separate threads or a pool of threads or whatever. And the main thread of control doesn't have to know, doesn't have to care how the processing is being performed. And this tends to work particularly well in environments or operating systems or whatever that has really good support for asynchronous I.O. Because essentially, asynchronous I.O. is a way of being able to allow asynchronous I.O. processing to take place without burdening the main CPU. It's often done through some kind of direct memory access, DMA, or background threads, or other kind of off-board hardware or cores or whatever, in order to be able to get things to run together more efficiently in parallel. OK, any questions about, about that? So at this point, you should have everything you need to uh, put all the pieces together. Uh, the programming assignment is due on, on Friday. Uh, let's see, a couple more things real quick. So uh, I think I mentioned a couple times before, all the material that we've done here is going to be massively redone, improved, filmed uh, in a real studio with proper lighting and so on, and will become part of uh, the world's first trans-institutional sequenced MOOC, or sequenced MOOCs, which will start probably at about mid-January. And what's cool about this is the first eight weeks or so of this multi-sequence uh, MOOC, trans-institutional MOOC sequence, is going to be done at University of Maryland with Adam Porter. And he's going to cover in much greater detail than we went into a lot of the user-facing programming aspects of Android. So fragments, activities, all the widgets, you know, ways of doing various kinds of interactions with the users, uh, dialogues, much, much more sophisticated than we covered, because we were really covering more of the systems programming aspects. And that'll run for about eight weeks. Uh, and there'll be a 
a bunch of things to learn there. Then my course will go next, and that'll probably run seven or eight weeks. And that'll be the stuff that we've covered, except way, way produced more uh, thoroughly, because I'll actually take time over the break to, to film it all effectively, <laughs> using the stuff that we did as a, as a basis and then improving upon it. And then the, the third part of the class, which will either be the second half of, of my class or its own class, depending on how we can work this out with uh, Coursera and the Vanderbilt administration and so on, will be a accessing cloud computing resources for mobile devices portion. And Jules White will be teaching that. So he'll be talking about sort of how do you program cloud applications, how do you do services in the cloud, how do you configure cloud environments, most likely using Google App Engine and something called Jetty, which is kind of a, a networking framework for writing servers in, uh, in Java. And so we're going to be having a common application that'll span each of these different sessions. And by the time we're all done, people will have been able to implement user interface part, the systems programming part, kind of like what we've been doing in this class, and then connecting to the cloud, which is kind of cool. And then if, uh, if we play our cards right and, and things go the way we want, we're probably going to have some kind of capstone course where we'll put all the pieces together and have people build some cool applications. Most probably aligned with some of the other MOOCs we have taking place here at Vanderbilt. Things like uh, nutrition and lifestyle nutrition by Jamie Pope, or the Jake Clayton's course on, on gaming, online gaming, with, a, with an English narrative flavor to it, and so on. So we'll, we'll try to find a way to get people to do interesting projects to implement stuff in the context of other interesting MOOCs that we're doing. So it's going to be a real grand experiment, and uh, I encourage you to keep an eye on it. You'll get a chance to learn even more about what we learned. And of course, as you graduate and go out in the real world, all those courses and, and the lectures, including all these, are all available on the web. So if you come across something in your new job or in your research as a grad student and you go, gosh, I really wish I knew how to do blah, blah, blah that we maybe didn't cover, or you'd like to see it again, or you forgot it, or you'd like to see a different perspective on it, you can go back and watch that content at your, at your leisure. Okay, any other questions?